Assalamu alaikum. In this video, we are going to discuss techniques of administration of local anesthesia. But before starting the lesson, I would like to acknowledge a common problem some of you are facing with the older videos. I have lately received messages about the playback speed being too fast and I totally agree. So I'm working on making better content for you every day and I'll make sure you don't have this problem in the upcoming videos. But about the previous videos, there is one thing that can be done. On the top right corner of your screen, you will see these three vertical dots. Press it and you will find an option of changing the playback speed from normal to whatever speed you prefer. I think 0.75 would be good. It will slow down the video and the problem will be solved. Alright, so let's do the techniques of local anesthesia. In the previous video, we did topical anesthesia, nerve block, tab block and field block. And here we are going to start with Beer's block, which is also known as intravenous regional anesthesia. In this technique, the anesthesia is administered intravenously, so we have to be very careful with the dose of the drug as large dose can lead to toxicity and cause adverse effects like seizures and cardiac arrest. So a small dose is preferred and a tourniquet is placed at the site of administration to prevent the drug from entering systemic circulation. Beer's block produces excellent anesthesia for short surgery, particularly for the upper limb, but it is not safe in lower limb surgery as it will require large dose and it can lead to toxic effects. So it is suited for ganglionectomy, carpal tunnel release, Dupuytren's contracture surgery or reduction of fractures. And the safest agent to be used in this procedure is 0.5% or up to 50 ml of prilocaine whereas bupivacaine is absolutely contraindicated as it can cause cardiac arrest. Now the procedure includes several steps. First a double tourniquet is placed with the proximal and distal cuff where the procedure is to be performed. It separates this area from the rest of the circulation. Then the arm is exsanguinated, which means to get as much blood out of there as possible. This is done by wrapping it with a tight elastic dressing as well as elevating it. Once this is done, the proximal cuff is inflated and the wrapping is removed. With tourniquet now inflated, slowly inject the local anesthetic. Then after 5 to 10 minutes, distal cuff is inflated and proximal cuff deflated. During this time, local anesthetic becomes effective and surgery can be performed. After completing surgery, distal cuff is deflated. And even if surgery is finished early, distal cuff should be left inflated for at least 20 minutes to prevent systemic toxicity. This was Beer's block. Next, we have a spinal anesthesia and epidural anesthesia. These are the lumbar vertebrae. And in the space inside, we have a spinal cord with its spinal nerves, CSF in the intrathecal space where spinal anesthesia is given by a spinal needle. Intrathecal space is covered by a sheet of dura matter. And this space between dura matter and vertebral wall is epidural space where epidural anesthesia is given through a catheter. Now let's go into the details of spinal anesthesia, which is achieved by injecting a single shot of local anesthetic into the lumbar intrathecal space. It blocks the spinal nerve roots, dorsal root ganglia and probably the periphery of the spinal cord. It produces intense and rapid block for surgery, but due to the autonomic sympathetic block, it results in hypotension, so the patient should be preloaded with the IV fluids and vasoconstrictors. And it should be given with caution in patients with hypovolemia and cardiovascular diseases. It is usually limited to surgeries below the level of T10 because if the level of block is above T10, severe hypotension and ventilatory failure may occur. And the very common complication of spinal anesthesia is spinal headache or dural puncture headache which is due to leakage of spinal fluid. It can be minimized by limiting the number of punctures and using fine bore pencil tip needle which are designed to split rather than cut the dura. In this way the headache is prevented but if it does occur then it can be treated with blood patch epidural injection which involves injecting 5 to 10 ml of the patient's blood into the epidural space at the site of previous puncture. So this blood plugs the leak of cerebrospinal fluid. Last is epidural anesthesia in which the anesthetic is injected in the epidural space. It is slower in onset than spinal anesthesia but it has the advantage of prolonged analgesia by multiple dosing or by continuous infusion through a catheter placed in the epidural space.
whereas continuous infusion through a catheter in a spinal anesthesia has been implicated in causing specific complications like infection, headache or corda equina syndrome. So this is why usually epidural anesthesia is preferred over spinal anesthesia. Due to its slow onset, it also allows better control of the resulting hypotension from sympathetic blockade and also reduces the blood loss. But it can cause urinary retention, so catheterization of bladder becomes necessary during the procedure. It is ideal for post-operative pain relief, but it does not produce adequate analgesia for surgical intervention. It also has some disadvantages like it is more difficult than spinal anesthesia with a higher failure rate and carries the risk of nerve damage, spinal injuries, risk of infections and epidural hematoma. So these were the techniques of local anesthesia administration. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe.